Good evening and welcome to the August 8th meeting of the Murfreesboro City School Board. We're glad to have those of you in the audience with us and we're glad to have those that are watching from home. At this time, I'm going to ask you to please stand as we have two of our new principals, Dr. Caitlin Bullard, principal at Discovery School, and Dr. Jeremy Lewis, principal at Bradley Academy, to lead us in our pledge, followed then by a moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And now I'm on to silence. Thank you. <coughs> All right, members of the board, you have seen and received had an opportunity to look over the agenda. Do we have a motion to approve the agenda as printed? So moved, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Richardson. We have a second. Second. Thank you, Ms. Long. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposition? And there is none. Thank you. Communications. Ms. Trail. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. In case you did not know, school began this week. <laughs> Shocker. It's been a it's been a great two days. <laughs> uh, we want to start out with talking about the City Schools Foundation. Uh, the City Schools Foundation will host a doubles tennis tournament. This is replacing our typical back to school dash. We're going to try something a little different this year. Um, it will be held at the Adams Tennis Complex on October 27th and 28th. So that Halloween weekend, uh, expect lots of tennis to be played. We're grateful for our partners with the city who is allowing us to use Adams Tennis Complex. Uh, speaking of the foundation, the foundation grants are open now for teachers, so that will stay open through mid-September, and we will be awarding those grants probably late October so that they can go ahead and spend those monies for the students that they're seeing today. Um, we also have had so many businesses and faith-based organizations, United Way, so many people who have donated back-to-school supplies for our uh, schools and for our students. and. Uh, helping our parents out. We appreciate them so much. Today I was able to attend the ribbon cutting for Staples and it was their ribbon cutting and we received a thousand dollars worth of school supplies. So right. not a bad ribbon cutting on behalf <laughs> of my, you know, for Murfreesboro City Schools, but Staples is always a big partner of ours and for us to receive that was just really a kind gesture on their part. I, as I was driving over here, I also received a note from National Healthcare Corporation and they have a large supply that they need to uh, give to us as well for school supplies. So again, our community is just amazing in their support of Murfreesboro City Schools. Um, also, we want to thank our MTSU athletes and all of the adult sororities and, and fraternities. And uh, I think several of you as well were at the opening of our schools yesterday and this morning, just having everyone cheering on those students as they got off the bus or uh, was at arrival or opening doors for parents and especially those that had their little book bags in their uh, hands along with their school supplies. We appreciate those and we appreciate MTSU and those sororities and fraternities always stepping up and always being a part of our opening day. It makes it fun. Uh, um, much different note, the MCS Hall of Fame is accepting nominations now for our second annual induction ceremony. The Hall of Fame recognizes and honors exceptional career individuals, including teachers and non-teachers that have had significant contributions for MCS and our students. The nomination opportunity will cease next week. So if you want to nominate your favorite teacher or non-teacher, lunchroom monitor, whoever it is, now's the time. There is some criteria because this is one of those things where the Hall of Fame really does um, have a standard and we wanna make sure we're recognizing the right people, but that's all on our website. So it's at cityschools.net. I know you're going to hear more about the case and lane pre-k in fact i'm looking at it right here on the screen but we do want you to mark uh august 23rd as the official open house ribbon cutting for that now we've already had uh, our students in they've already had their open house but this is more of a community open house so that people can see just the vast changes that's happened in that uh, location so august 23rd and you'll get more information on that 
Lastly, I want to thank all of the individuals who assisted in the poverty simulation that was held at Case and Lane Academy last week. It was an amazing um, uh, role-playing experience, and uh, several of the members that are here being recognized tonight are also volunteers um, at that um, simulation, so we do appreciate them and the volunteers that come, came in that day. That is my communication, sir. Thank you, ma'am, very much. Wonderful. Always good to hear from you. All right, introduction of new principals. Dr. Duke? Yes, sir, and I know you've met them informally tonight during the pledge. I'm going to ask Dr. Bullard and Dr. Lewis to join, uh, to join us at the podium tonight. Um, I am very pleased tonight to introduce the last two principals we haven't had a chance to formally introduce to the board. I'll start with Dr. Caitlin Bullard. I am pleased tonight to welcome her back as the new principal of the Discovery School. Uh, many of you know Dr. Bullard as she originally joined MCS as principal of Case and Lane in 2019. And during her tenure there, she led the school with great success as they received multiple awards, grants, and honors, including the Tennessee STEM designation. Dr. Bullard most recently served as a district administrator in Rutherford County Schools. And in addition to her classroom experience and tenure as principal of Case and Lane, she's also served as an instructional coach, which is where I first got to know Dr. Bullard and her depth of instructional knowledge. I can truly say she is an outstanding leader who models excellence. She is an exceptional communicator and has the qualifications and the vision to lead Discovery into the future and has had a very successful first two days. So I'd like to introduce and welcome Dr. Bullard first. <laughs> Good evening, board. Thank you guys so much um, for having me this evening. I know I've had the opportunity to speak with several of you over the past few weeks. Um, as I've told my staff, this is now my seventh day back in MCS. Um, this district has a very special place in my heart, and I think all of you know and you share that um, with me. Murphy's Bar City Schools is a remarkable place, and Discovery is a really unique and incredible school here in our district. Um, so it's just an honor and a privilege to lead at Discovery this year. We're spending a lot of time at the school talking about relationships and collaboration and kind of our um, vision at Discovery, which is learning anchored in Discovery. And this year, it's really learning anchored in rediscovery, really rediscovering who we are as a school. And I look forward to sharing that with you guys as we move forward throughout this year um, and to keep you guys updated about what's going on at Discovery. So thank you guys again. Uh, our second introduction is Dr. Jeremy Lewis, who I'm also proud to introduce as the principal of Bradley Academy. Dr. Lewis, as you know, replaced Mr. Rocha, who was appointed as our new assistant superintendent of student support services. He's a resident of Murfreesboro. He has uh, two of his children are in our school system as well, and he has previously served as the executive principal of Croft Design Center Middle School in Nashville for the past seven years. He brings experience in other school leadership roles, including being a dean of instruction and an assistant principal, but moreover, Lewis has a history of developing effective community partnerships incorporated with student learning and success. Uh, Dr. Lewis is a proven administrator who will help connect Bradley's STEM designation to the daily curriculum and arts integrated program. Uh, we believe he has the character, vision, and experience to lead Bradley well into the future. And I was had an opportunity to be there with him this morning, and I can say he is also off to a fantastic start at Bradley. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Lewis to the podium. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening, board. Good evening. Uh, it's been great to meet many of you, and I look forward to meeting all of you in the, in the near future. Like Dr. Duke said, we've had a fantastic first uh, couple days to the school year. It's been great just immersing myself in the community and meeting everyone and just learning what it truly means to be a part of the Bradley family. So thank you. Y'all have a great night. Thank you. You too. Thank you. All right. Mr. Barch is going to do the next segment. That's right. Good evening. How, How you are you? I'm well, thank you. I hope you all are all right. I have the pleasure of introducing our amazing uh, school, uh, the new division that Murfreesboro Police Department has started for school safety. And we're honoring and speaking about our SROs, but uh, having all their supervisors here to talk about it is just fantastic, including Chief Bowen is here so thank you for coming tonight but I'm going to turn it over to Captain Fanning who is the captain of that newly uh, designed division to talk about the SROs and that division
Well, good evening. It's good, it's, evening. good evening. to come before y'all tonight. Uh, thank you first and foremost for uh, letting us come and talk to you for a minute about uh, our new school safety division and kind of uh, where we're at with it and where we want to go with it. Uh, we really want y'all to know that uh, creating this new division really is driven by our ultimate goal, which is to keep our kids safe along with our teachers, our administrators, and every school that we got. You know, that is job one for us, and we are truly grateful to uh, be able to do this. Uh, first, I want to thank Chief Bowen over there for his vision in saying that this is a priority. It's not just saying the words, but doing the things. That sometimes it's tough, and it's a lot of resources to do, but the most valuable asset we have are the kids in our schools, and their protection comes is great. Now, how do we do that? Uh, really, we want it to be a comprehensive approach. Uh, we want to have everybody be a stakeholder. We want to create a culture where not just our kids, but our parents and our school, uh, our teachers, our administrators, we all feel comfortable in sitting in a room and talking about how do we do this? Not just from the external threats that we all know that come, we're all aware of those, but internally. What about our kids who are hurting, kids who are confused, kids who are struggling every day? How do we form relationships with those kids? How do we, how do we find the right resources for them to get them where they need to be? And so our, our, our SROs, you know, they, they are first and foremost our protectors, but they're also relationship builders with everybody in that school because we really want kids to thrive in our school system. We think that's, that's important and that's part of what we do and that's part of my job and part of what Chief Bowen has asked me to make sure that, that we're on top of taking care of for y'all. Um, it's a commitment from us. That's how important it is. And it's, it's my number one goal. Uh, once upon a time I wore a bunch of hats. Right now I wear one hat. And that is to take care of our kids and whatever that looks like. And so we just want y'all to know that we, we just want a safe environment, a, a good learning environment for all our kids. Um, I, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about some of our supervisors. Uh, Lieutenant Carter unfortunately couldn't be here. He's the number two person within our division. Uh, really though, the people that are the hardest working people here are standing right over there. Uh, <laughs> Sergeant Williams, right over on the left. Bring them up. Oh, Sergeant Shannon bring over there. Bring them up. Bring them up. Y'all come on up here. They are Excuse really me, the Chairman. people Please that make up. this machine run. <laughs> Without that, um, I would be dead in the water, to be honest with y'all. Um, I might have the rank, but these are the folks who are really doing the work every day. These are the people that our kids see and our principals see every day, and I can't tell you just how proud I am of them and uh, our agency in general. So. Just a little bit about us, about what we do, uh, and I just want y'all to know that you can feel free to reach out anytime to us, to any member of our staff. Um, if you have questions, you have concerns, something you don't understand, uh, I know Dr. Duke and I, we have a great relationship about working together to make sure we get things done, but if there's things you don't know, you want to know, ask, and we'll do everything in our power to make things right so y'all get what you need. So I'll open that up if y'all have any questions or anything. Thank you, sir. I'm, I'm going to say from experience from many years ago when we got our first SRO at where I was, uh, there are blessings. And I've seen the ones that we have under your leadership in our schools today, and they are a blessing. And in today's world, keeping our young people safe is, is very important to all of us, and I know it is to you, and we certainly appreciate the job that you do, not only in the schools, but outside of the schools as well. Thank you, sir. We appreciate that. Right. Oh, whoa, no, you can't leave you before we get <laughs> I thought oh, I was going to no. get away. <laughs> no comment, but I believe every one of these individuals in uniform that, that have not just committed, but promised to maintain the safety and security and the integrity of our schools gets a standing ovation and a round of applause. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for indulging me. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you for everything you do. All right, sir. The best of MCS. <clears throat> Yes, uh, again, my favorite point of the meeting tonight is to do our best of MCS recognitions. Um, as our school board knows, the mission of Murfreesboro City Schools is to ensure the personal and academic success of each child. What we know as a district is that even though so much of that success relies on what happens in our classrooms every day, there are also supports outside of our classroom and district that are critical in helping us achieve that mission. 
One of the core ways we ensure the personal and academic success is by making sure that every child has access to food that they may need. Mm -hmm. Last year alone, our school nutrition department served 1.9 million meals from August to May. Additionally, this summer, when school was technically out, they served over 52,000 meals during the summer months of June and July. This shows that our students and families depend on the schools to help ensure our students have the food they need. However, as we know, schools are only open Monday through Friday, which limits access to food over the weekend and holiday breaks. This is why our weekend food backpack program is so important. Each week, our team, led by Sharice McDaniel, <clears throat> Uh, delivers food bags to every school in our district so no student goes hungry when school is not in session. Our school counselors identify students in need and ensure they receive the bags as every week. As you can imagine, it's quite an undertaking to pack these bags and we could not do it alone. We rely on the generosity of our community to help get that done. And tonight for our best of MCS, we would like to represent and recognize two groups who play a key role in the success of this program and helping us meet the needs of our students. So first, I am gonna ask uh, Pastor Steve Hudson and Ms. Gloria Allen from New Vision Church here in Murfreesboro to join me at the podium, if that's okay. New Vision has partnered with our district for over five years. And last year alone, they assisted in packing 12,922 bags of food. They have been faithful partners that you can find in our warehouse every Wednesday making this happen. I'm also going to ask uh, Pastor Trey Carey and Ms. Angela Morell to join us at the podium as well. The, uh, Pastor Carey and Ms. Morell are from Fellowship United Methodist Church. Fellowship has also partnered with MCS for over 10 years, and they collect and pack items at their church each week and then deliver it to a few specific schools that they have partnered with to ensure those needs are met. This targeted approach helps us ensure that we are using our resources wisely and meeting the needs of all students. Last year, the group from Fellowship United Methodist uh, packed and delivered 5,000 bags of food to the schools that they serve. In MCS, we believe that everyone in a community benefits when our schools are strong even if they don't have children in the school system. And both of these groups work each week to make sure our schools are strong by meeting the basic needs of our students. So Pastor Carey, Pastor Hudson, Ms. Allen, and Ms. Morell, on behalf of the entire school district, we wanna say thank you for what you do each week and thank you for helping us achieve our mission. There is no doubt that your teams represent not only the best of MCS, but the best of Murfreesboro. Mm -hmm. And we are a stronger city and a stronger school district because of your partnership. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. We couldn't do it without you. I'll awesome, tell you. Mm. Spotlight on education. I'm getting back to my podium, and there you go. <laughs> yes. Right. Yes, we are ready for our spotlight on education tonight. And tonight, for our spotlight, we are going to be recognizing um, and talking a little bit about our brand new pre K building that opened. Uh, just uh, recently, so I'm going to ask uh, the pre-K principal, Ms. Robin Newell, and Roxanna Dove, our pre-K uh, instructional specialist, to join us at the podium. I'm going to turn it over to them. Hey. Good evening. I do that? I do. Okay. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. This started here. Oh, I'm sorry. All right, this is before. These are, um, this is the, now it's the workroom, but it was the kitchen when it was the former daycare center, and you can see that it um, is a little sad looking. Mm. Uh, the city went in and, and just ripped everything out, and you will see the changes in that. So these are some of the classrooms. 
Um, they had to replace toilets and um, yeah. patch floors. And the picture on the right is the workroom where um, those are new countertops that they put in mm -hmm. for us. Uh, and this is an after picture and it, uh, the, all the walls are freshly painted and all of the teachers have moved in their items for students. Oh, These are other wow. classrooms. Um, just looks great. Um, teachers were amazing with the ability. To, the, all the classrooms are different shapes. So they came in and each classroom is unique in how they um, designed their areas for their students. I don't know how many pictures. Oh, that's, that's it. So we had um, our first day today. We had our um, IPK students started this morning and we're having open house every night this week or four nights this week. And um, it's just great to see teachers in there and the cutest kids you've ever seen. <laughs> I'll share a little bit about the classrooms there. Um, so just backing up a little bit to when Dr. Duke first told us about this program or this opportunity, I was so excited when I heard the words West Side, the mm -hmm. West Side of Murfreesboro. So last year we only had two integrated classrooms on that side of town. This year we have eight. So that's really exciting. Um, we have five voluntary pre-K classrooms. Each of those classrooms serve ch 20 children. So 100 students at Case and Lane in our voluntary pre-K, those are all four-year-olds. Um, that program is funded through a state grant through the Department of Education. We also have the integrated pre-K program, and that is for students with a disability or also typically developing children. We call them peer models is what we refer to them as. Um, these classrooms, we have three now at Case and Lane, um, and they have one teacher and two educational assistants in the classroom. So we're starting out Case and Lane um, with 45 students in our integrated classroom. And that includes both children with special needs and our typically developing peers. Um, we do have a waiting list this year. So we have several students that are waiting to get into the voluntary pre-K program. We have about 45 on that list right now. And also a little bit smaller list for our peer models, but there is a waiting list for those students as well. Um, so I'm super excited about the students coming, about this opportunity. And I just wanna share thanks to everyone that supported this endeavor. Absolutely. I know it's been lots of work over the summer and we appreciate it. Yep, and we welcome any of you to come out and visit and see the, the remarkable transition that has happened there. It's great. It's great. I visited in that building, it was one day last week. Uh, the one, nobody school wide there, I don't think, but construction was going on and it really looked good. Yeah. For, and it was far from being finished, I'm sure, but what I saw was very nice. Well, the kids are there now, so it looks really good. Right. Well, I'll need to come back, won't I? Yes, please. please. Mr. Chairman, if I may. Yes, sir. I, I'm not going to skip an opportunity to thank the city of Murfreesboro again for helping to acquire this, to, to work and partner with us. It only strengthens our relationship uh, with the city and then only advances the opportunities for our young folks. And then I, to Ms. Newell, I want to say that I'm extraordinarily grateful that you're at the helm here because I think you are particularly well suited to get to the emotional and the psychological components of what these youngsters need. And I, I look forward to seeing what the two of you guys can do together. This is going to be incredible. I cannot thank you enough and I look forward to visiting maybe some VIP treatment, but that's up to y'all. <laughs> I like that answer even better. Good Thank answer. you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, ladies, seriously. Thank you. Yes, sir, Dr. I just, I just want to echo again what Roxana and Robin said. Um, mm. This has all happened extremely quickly. <laughs> and when I go back to just a few months ago, this wasn't even on our radar. And so it wasn't just that we acquired this building. To acquire the building, to uh, work with the city, to get it um, I'll, I will tell you, they did a lot more than uh, I had ever hoped or, or thought they would be able to do. Mm -hmm. um, and they've just been, uh, Mr. Holtz at the city, Mr. Huddleston, the entire team um, have just been great in helping working and meet those needs and making sure our building is taken care of. And then a special, of course, to uh, Mr. Williford and his team. Mm -hmm. Again, what was on their list for this summer did not include making sure a new pre-k building was ready and moved eight classrooms full of furniture got all that ready in a very short timeline uh, mr barch and his team have done a great job leading this the last couple weeks uh, so it's just truly been an amazing experience and we're going to be a better district because of it so again i just want to echo that and thank everyone at the everyone at the city and the city schools office who really have been working hard to make this a reality so 
Thank you, ladies. We look forward to wonderful things, and we know where they're going to be there. Yep. Thanks. Next item on the agenda is our public comment section. We have no one and have registered to address the board tonight. Consent items. We have a motion to approve the consent items. So moved. Thank you, Ms. Moore. Have a second. Second. Thank you, Ms. Dodd. Any question or comment? I see none. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposition? And there is none. Thank you. All right, action item. The approval of the Extended School Advisory Board. Yes, sir. As a recipient of the 21st Century Community Learning Grant, our extended school program is required to maintain a parent advisory board. The board meets twice per year, once in the fall and once in the spring. The purpose of this team is to provide the families we serve in ESP an opportunity to provide input and to align our programming with what our families desire and the needs of their students. So we are recommending approval of the ESP advisory board as presented in your packet. I have a motion to approve the Extended School Advisory Board. So moved. Thank you, Ms. Dodd. We have a second. Second. Thank you, Mr. Ballard. Any question or comment? I see none. All in favor of the motion say aye. Aye. Any opposition? And there is none. Thank you. Pre-K Advisory Council. The Community Pre-K Advisory Council, which we also refer to as CPAC, is a committee of members representing the local school board, parents, teachers, nonprofit providers, for-profit providers, Head Start, and the business community. The council's aim is to provide input to the local board of education in considering the number and type of existing programs currently serving children four years of age within our LEA. The committee is a requirement of the state's VPK grant, which you just heard Ms. Dove speak of, and we are recommending approval of the CPAC team as presented for the 23-24 school year. I have a motion to approve the Pre-K Advisory Council. So moved. Thank you, Mr. Ballard. We have a second. Second. Thank you, Ms. Moore. Any question or comment? I see none. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? And there is none. Thank you. Director's evaluation. The 2324 Directors of Schools evaluation tool is being presented to the board for approval. This tool was revised through consultation with the board chair using TSBA's recommended documents. Changes from the 2223 tool are identified in red. The board and the district's administrative team will complete the approved evaluation in May at the conclusion of the school year. Mr. Chairman, uh, I would move at this time to table any further action on the approval of this. There's a few different metrics that I'd like to change. This isn't necessarily an eloquent statement. There's a few tweaks I would still like to put into uh, the actual metric system and a few changes in the wording, and, and I believe that would probably be better uh, situated to be discussed in our retreat setting. Uh, of course, I'm happy to hear what the board has to say, but there's just a few other things I, I'd like to have some time to look over. Did you make that in the form of a motion? I thought I did, but if you I did, didn't, okay. I'm move. We have a second to the motion. I'll second that. Thank you, Ms. Moore. Any question or comment? Ms. Bush, we have a timeline for this. Ideally, we would need it done by August so that Dr. Duke understands the metrics by which he's going to be assessed this school year. Uh, but we do have a workshop coming up uh, August 22nd, so we could revisit this and I can bring some different models to the board for you. You've only seen this specific one. I can work with Dr. Duke and, and bring a few others. Okay. Am I correct in remembering that this instrument before it's presented to the board as such has got to be approved by Dr. Duke and the board chair? It does have to be made in collaboration with Dr. Duke and the board chair, the executive committee, yes. Okay. All right, you heard a motion and a second. Do I have all in favor say aye? Aye. aye. Any opposition? And there is none, thank you. And we'll look forward to having that in August. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Board of Policy 1.901, Charter School Applications. This is on first reading, so this will have two readings, but this would be a, a recommendation to approve changes to Board Policy 1.901. 
Changes recommended to this board policy are made to comply with changes made to state board policy 6.111 that now requires school districts provide a response to charter school operators who file a letter of intent with the letter of intent is completed incorrectly. Additionally, there is a statutory change that gives charter schools additional appeal options if an amended application is denied by a board. This language has been added to policy 1.901, and I do want to just clarify that those letters of intent this year are due by December 4th, 2024, by any charter schools who want to apply to Murfreesboro City Schools for operation. The recommendation would be to approve changes to board policy 1.901 on first reading. We have a motion to approve the change. I have a question. So moved. We got a motion. Now we have a second. Second. Now we got a second. Now a question. Question. Ballard? Yeah, I, I just want to get a general understanding that as we go through these other charter school uh, policies, really, are we doing anything outside of what is being dictated to us as far as from the, the legislature and the charter school, you know, what's being given driven from there? I guess what I'm saying is, are we doing anything, taking any liberties with anything they've given us? No, all of this, all of the changes that we're making tonight are statutory. Uh, statutorily, the State Board of Education was giving was given a lot of latitude this, this last year, and so they made a lot of changes uh, that require authorizers to add to or create new policies and we would be an authorizer as a school district so we are required to if we grant um, approval to a charter school applying to the district for operation we would be that authorizer um, that process is is lengthy it's very difficult so this would be in preparation we would not know whether there is intent from our, for a charter school to apply to Murfreesboro City Schools until December. Um, but if we do get a letter that starts the process, their formal application is due no later than February 1st, um, unless there's a holiday or a weekend that that applies to. But outside of that, we would then start that review process. So all of these, in short, <laughs> To answer your question, um, all of these are statutory or uh, changes pursuant to the state board. So, in any, any case where we were to reject a charter school for whatever you know performance or whatever reasons we have that we set forth, and they we decide that we are going to reject that, all of that's appealable to the state charter board. Is is that correct? They, they get to, to the extent that we reject based on a faulty application, they do get the opportunity to amend their application and reapply to Murfreesboro City Schools. If we deny again, then they do get the opportunity to appeal to the state and, and go through that authorizing process. So really anything that we were, if we took action against the charter school, they could appeal that to the state board and we could easily be overruled every time. Yes, so to, kind of to clarify like though, that it would be the like commission. I... They've set up a separate authorizing commission mm -hmm. now. It's no longer the state board. But yes, you could be overridden. So we would been, be symbolic if we did reject any of these or didn't accept the policies or we wanted to change the policies. It would all be symbolism over substance. I don't know that you could reject, because the state statute now reads that you do have to have this in policy, I don't know that the board could reject the policy as written. I think we have to have one uh, with this language in the policy. To the extent that we were to reject an application, though, based on its merits, you are able to do that as a board. They would have some additional appeal rights under the new statute. Okay, thank you. Um, so my understanding then is on these policies, when it really comes down and boils down to the bottom line, we don't really have a choice except to ex accept right. to accept the changes 
because they're being mandated by the State Board of Education and the legislature. Am I correct? That is correct. Thank you. Mr. Richardson? Mr. Chairman, I, I hate to sound like I'm repeating everything that's being said up here, but to be clear, this is the state government mandating and dictating what local government does. Is that correct? That, yes, we do have a little bit of latitude uh, to, <laughs> you, you can tell you're an attorney. Um, <laughs> but yes, you do have a little bit of, I feel like I'm in a deposition all of a sudden. Um, <laughs> you do have a little bit of latitude to, to determine, it's gonna come down to your authorizing agreement. So we do have a little bit of latitude there to set some parameters in our authorizing agreement with a charter school. But a lot of that has been dictated by the state. So some of your authority as a board has been taken away by state statute. That's yes. Correct. Yes, council, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> okay, maybe it's just me, but I don't understand. Can you explain to me what it means by not filing the correct application? That's a good question. I don't get that. Yes. Are there different applications in these charter schools? They don't know which application to fill out. So I'm just confused. No, it could be. So a lot of times, like with the letter of intent, they may check the wrong box. That happened a couple of times last year. So to the extent that they submit an incorrect letter of intent or, or they could do that with the application as well. Uh, most districts do use the application provided by the Tennessee Department of Education okay. to the extent that they don't complete it correctly and we give them notice that they don't com complete it correctly, we're required to. Okay. They do have the opportunity to respond and amend. Thank you for explaining that. I, so basically this is to get out of them it's a technicality. So like, we can't just say, no, you can't because you checked the wrong box. Yes. That's what this is. Yes. All right, I understand. I understand completely now. Any other questions or comments? I want to thank Ms. Bush for trying to explain that so we could understand <laughs> that. That's, that's like throwing spaghetti Political against the wall. Political tightrope. I was gonna say, <laughs> throw that making me against the wall and see sweat what a sticks. little bit tonight. Yes, I understand. <laughs> You earn your pay today. That's right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, we have a motion to approve policy 1.901 charter school application. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? Abstain. Abstain, okay, one abstention. All right, motion passes. Policy 1.902. State board policy 6.111 was updated to include requirements for charter agreements that include adding performance standards for charter school academic, financial and organizational performance and fee-based services. Board policy 1.902 was updated to include those requirements. The recommended approval would be to approve changes to board policies 1.902 on first reading. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Richardson. We have a second. Second. Thank you, Mr. Ballard. Any question or comment? I see none. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? And I see none. Thank you. 1.904, Charter School Intervention. Public, uh, public Chapter 206 added three tiers of progressive interventions that must be taken by a charter school authorizer before re the revocation of the charter agreement. The addition of tiered interventions for charter school deficiencies has been added to board policy 1.904. So to clarify, previously uh, under state statute, the authorizer could revoke the charter agreement based on a breach of that agreement. State statute has changed requiring us to go through an intervention process. So public chapter 206 required board policy 1.904 to change. Based on the, that statutory change, we would recommend approval to changes to board policy 1.904 on first reading. I have a motion to approve policy 1.904, the change. So moved. Thank you, Mr. Ballard. We have a second. Second. Thank you, Ms. Moore. Any question or comment, Ms. Moore? Yes. Um, so I noticed that on when we're going through the tiers, and working through these. So um, on tier two, we say that part of what our notice to them um, is that we give them kind of a timeline for when they have to correct it. But on tier one, we're not giving them that timeline before, you know, we tell them what needs to be corrected and what needs to happen, but we don't require that we give them a timeline. And so I, f 
I feel like we need to add that same timeline provision to tier one. Otherwise, when do we know when it's time to move to tier two? Um, so I feel like not that we're setting the timeline itself now, but just that we require that we give them a timeline so then we know if they haven't fixed it by that time, it's time to move to the next level. And that's clear for them too. It's you know just clear for all parties involved that a timeline would be in place. And Mr. Chairman, to sort of dovetail to that, I believe the phrase reasonable timeline, though not a date certain, may be a, a King Solomon approach to, to getting that in, in clearer in our own code. Well, I mean, even the language that's in Tier 2, we just could mirror that for Tier 1, where it says outlining the terms of the probation and the timeline for correction. And I feel like in Tier 1, you know, you notice the, the specific deficiency, mm -hmm. information on possible con consequences, and a timeline for correction. It seems like we could do that. Okay. Um, so I don't know if I need to make a motion to do that or if that's just something we suggest to you and come back for second reading. Yes, I can change that for second reading. So you would, we will vote on it uh, on first reading tonight. And when it comes back for second reading, we'll uh, approve changes to board policy 1.904 on second reading with, uh, as amended. Okay. So we can do that. Yeah. Well, we have a motion and a second. We have all, all in favor say aye. 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 Any aye. opposition? Abstain. All right, sir. 1.905. State statute now requires a charter school authorizer to conduct an interim review in the fifth year of the charter school's term in accordance with guidelines provided by the Tennessee Department of Education. This statutory requirement has been added to board policy 1.905. Additionally, state statute and state board policy 6.111 establishes standards for renewal criteria to be used in renewal determinations by the board. This language is also added to board policy 1.905. And just to clarify that timeline, when a board uh, becomes an authorizer, that authorizing agreement term is for 10 years. So a charter school operates for 10 years mm -hmm. under that charter agreement. The staff recommendation would be to recommend approval of changes to board policy 1.905 on first reading. We have a motion to approve policy 1.905, the change on first reading. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Richard, we have a second. Second. Thank you, Ms. Dodd. Any question or comment? Ms. Dodd? So this is uh, the legislature saying five years. Right? Or the, the state statute, no. State statute says 10 years, and uh, the state statute now says we have to do an interim review in five years, so it's not a surprise if we get to year 10 and say we're not reauthorizing the charter school. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Richardson? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Does that mean we could not conduct a review before the fifth year? No, I think you could, you could set in your charter agreement that authorizing agreement that you would review on an annual basis or you have a lot of latitude to determine how you want to review a lot of schools uh, do do an annual review or an annual check-in with charter school uh, administration just to ensure that they're following the metrics provided to them so that would be something we could set I, I would like to consider uh, some language to that effect for the second reading if, if council is not uh, if too disagreeable to that we're putting a lot on you tonight I apologize so can you say more about what, just so I can be clear, because what I thought I heard Ms. Bush saying was that that's something we put into the charter itself if we get an application and go through agreeing on a charter agreement, like the contract with the um, charter school. So does it need to be in here as well that we do annual check-ins or just when we're, if, if we get to the point where we are developing a charter with this operator for a charter school? A very good question. I, I am agreeable to either have it within the agreement, the document itself, or enshrined in policy. Uh, since we do have that latitude, uh, I believe we should the, uh, exercise the authority that we were elected to exercise, and so I believe it should be added to the policy. However, yes, Lord? <laughs> Uh, I believe that, that either one would effectuate what it is that, that I believe we should accomplish. I agree. Ms. Dodd, question? I was just going to say I, I totally agree, and that's mm -hmm. kind of what I was trying to get at a minute ago, but, but you knew how to say it. So. I got your thank back. Thank you. Well, thank you. All right, we have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? And there is none. Thank you. 
All right, a policy 1.906. No, no, good. State Board Policy 6.111 adds language outlining the reasons for charter agreement revocation. The language of Board Policy 1.906 has been updated to reflect changes to the State Board Policy that include statutory appeal rights granted to the charter school if the agreement is revoked. Additionally, state law requires the charter authorizer to develop protocols for charter school closures prior to the board denying renewal or revoking a charter school agreement. Board, 1 .9, board policy 1.906 has been updated to require the director of schools to develop administrative procedures to establish procedures for transition of charter school in the event of a closure. Staff recommendation would be to recommend approval of changes to board policy 1.906 on first reading. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Richardson. We have a second. 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 Thank you, Mr. Ba Ms. Ba Mr. Ballard. Excuse me. You there? Yeah. That's all right. Any question or comment? All in favor of the motion, say aye. Aye. Any opposition? And there is none. Thank you. Policy 2.805, purchasing. Changes are recommended to Board Policy 2.805 to clarify what coordination with the City of Murfreesboro will be required for purchase purposes of purchasing. Purchases requiring or involving contracted services for the following will require coordination with the City of Murfreesboro Purchasing and Project Development Departments. Construction or maintenance involving architecture, engineering, or landscape architecture. Remodeling of existing buildings, facilities, or permanent fixtures. Addition of buildings, facilities, or permanent fixtures. Changing grading and or drainage of, uh, on property owned by the city and land disturbances. Murfreesboro City School staff have been working closely with the City of Murfreesboro on these types of projects. This policy adjustment provides clarity and just formalizes those practices. Staff recommendation would be to approve the changes to Board po Policy 2.0805 on first reading. I have a motion to approve the change in the policy. Move to approve. Thank you, Mr. Ballard. We have a second. Second. Thank you, Ms. Long. Any questions? Mr. Richardson and then Ms. Moore. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Th this appears to uh, enshrine in our policy the continued efforts that we'll make to have cooperation with the city, which I think is just uh, indicative of what we're already trying to achieve and what we have been doing uh, under the leadership of Dr. Duke, and, and I'm grateful for that. So I, I will be voting uh, very happily for this. Ms. Moore? Um, I just wanted to confirm, this is this is what we already do, right? We're not placing new limits on ourselves. We're just kind of putting into policy what we already do. So this yes. doesn't limit our kind of autonomy or anything like that in ways we haven't already kind of decided to do. No, no, it just is basically putting it into board policy when we would collaborate with Murfreesboro City on those projects. And okay. Dr. Duke, if you want to. Yeah, and I'll just add, this is something we've been doing for several years since I've been here, and I know even before I came, uh, when we work with the different project managers here at the city on these projects, um, specifically any time we do anything to a building. And then there are also some state laws as well that require, if, for instance, engineers being involved if it, it addresses certain parts of landscaping or drainage or things like that. So they're great partners with us in that. This is just to provide clarity on both sides that we have it formalized in process of how we're going to make sure we know who we're communicating with and there's no confusion. Okay, thank you. This has nothing to do with charter schools. No, sir. <laughs> I'm very happy to say. <laughs> well, we have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposition? And there is none. Thank you. Purchase orders. Policy 2.808. Board Policy 2.808 has been updated to include changes to clarify requirements for contract approval and signatory authority. Specifically, the policy now includes requirements that contracts equal to or greater than $50,000 require board approval and executive committee signature, and contracts less than $50,000 may be approved and signed by the director of schools. This policy requires that any contracts approved with a value between $25,000 and $50,000 be included for board review at the board meeting following the contract's approval. The policy has been updated to include a list of contracts that require board approval regardless of the dollar amount. The staff recommendation be, would be to approve changes to board policy 2.808 on first reading. 
So moved, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Richardson. We have a second. Second. Thank you, Ms. Dodd. Any question or comment? All in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Any opposition? And there is none. Thank you. Policy 4.203. State Board Policy 3.300 was updated in May 2023 to require local boards to include information on summer programming and summer makeup days and board policy. Board Policy 4.203 is a new policy that complies with the requirements of State Board Policy 3.300. The staff recommendation would be to approve changes to board policy 4.203 on first reading. We have a motion to approve the policy 4.203 change. So moved. Thank you, Ms. Moore. We have a second. 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 Thank you, Ms. Long. Any question or comment? Mr. Richardson? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Duke, what's the fiscal impact on this? We receive grant money from the state for our summer school park program. Last year, that funding was just over $2 million that we received for summer school. That included our transportation grant as well. Um, and we have been informed that that funding will continue from the state, which is critical for our success. Like, because again, we're not just operating a small camp. We have principals, school secretaries, crossing guards that we pay the city back for. SROs, we run a full program in June, and so that money is uh, vitally important for the operation. Thank you, Dr. Duke. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All in favor of the policy say aye. 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 Any opposition? And there is none. Thank you. Board Policy 6.2011, Voluntary Pre-K Attendance. The Tennessee Department of Education requires each school board operating a voluntary pre-K program to have a policy outlining the requirements of VPK attendance and a process for dismissal of children from the program if necessary. Board Policy 6.2011 is a new policy that will comply with the requirements of the Department of Education uh, and is just going to clarify and codify our current procedures into board policy. The staff recommendation would be to approve Board Policy 6.2011 on first reading. We have a motion to approve the policy. So moved. Thank you, Mr. Ballard. We have a second. Second, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Richard. Dr. Duke. I'm sorry, and I just wanted to point out, and I think you heard uh, Ms. Stubb say today, we currently have a waiting list of about 45 students at VP, in our VK, VPK program, and with those spots being so limited, um, Mr. Rocha and his team will be working, of course, with our schools to monitor that attendance of VPK, but just my public uh, announcement to, to all of our families, that attendance doesn't just matter K-6, but it matters in pre-K as well because those are very limited numbers of slots and we want to make sure that any child that attends is there on a regular basis and can get the value of it. You get the full benefit of the program. Yes, sir. All right, you have a motion and a second. All in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Any opposition? And there is none. Thank you. All right, approval for the contract for HVAC renovations at Hobgood. Yes, sir. We received bids uh, with, for the HVAC renovations at Hobgood Elementary. Uh, bid responses were reviewed by the Murfreesboro City Purchasing Department, Johnson & Bailey, which is the architect firm we're working with. Uh, of course, our finance department at the city schools. X Energy Incorporated was the lowest bidder for the project. There were a total of three bids submitted for this project. Funds for the project have been previously approved through our ESSER 3 budgeting process. The bid for the project at Hobgood Elementary was $1,489,000, and we are recommending a board approval of the attached contract with X Energy Incorporated. Okay. I have a motion to accept the bid. So, so moved. moved. Thank you, Ms. Dodd. We have a second. Second. Thank you, Ms. Moore. And any question or comment? Dr. Mr. Ballard? Do we have experience with Synergy? Ms. Williams, I'm going to defer to you. I think this is the first time they've put in a bid for this um, for this work. Is that correct? Yes, it is. This is this is the first time they have so applied the for a bid for city was, schools. Was well, excuse me. The bid was reviewed as far as their ability to fulfill the contract. Yes. But yet yeah, we don't really have their experience. Did we seek outside work? You know, experience to yes. fulfill this, that. This 
vendor has, has been vetted by the city purchasing department as well. There are quite a few requirements that they had to meet because this is coming out of federal funds, one of which they had to be registered with the federal government under the SAM.gov and have a unique identifier and they had to attest to certain qualifications and they could not be suspended or debarred from any other federal contracts. We also checked the state website and the Department of State to make sure they have a valid license, business license, and then the contractor's license as well. Okay, and they're located here? In they're, they have offices in Nashville and Franklin. The majority, well, all of the vendors who applied were from Nashville and Franklin area. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Good questions. Ms. Long? Can I ask the timeline of this particular project? Mr. Bartsch, you want to talk about the timeline a little bit? There was an um, initial conversation of trying to do it during breaks, uh, but uh, and there might be some uh, pre-work that might happen during those breaks that wouldn't involve, you know, it would be minimal, but the, the bulk of the work will be as soon as school is out. In, the, in May. In May. The, the board, the contract does specify a substantial completion date by June 30, Jul, I think July 30th of 2024 in December. Uh, because these are federal funds paid for out of ESSER dollars, this is the last year for those funds. And so we have to make sure that that project is completed uh, while we still have access to these funds. So the contract does specify a substantial completion date to make sure that this work is done. Okay. Ms. Dodd? So um, before you leave, I know the Reeves Rogers is coming up on the agenda. So what's the completion date for that one? Is it the same? It's similar. Uh, there's some things that have come up today that we might be able to work on some, uh, depending on what's going on, that we might be able to work on some things a little bit earlier with the Reeves okay. Rogers. It would take some significant coordination. Who that coordination is exciting to me, so we're going to see if we can pull that off. <laughs> okay. I will say for the funds, though, they, it's the same because it's the same funds of money. We do have to have substantial completion by both projects by the end of next summer. So that would be the latest for that substantial completion date, um, even though I know Mr. Barch is itching to get started sooner. And, the re and one other reason why we're looking at that Reeves Rogers different timetable is because we don't, wouldn't want, if the contractor is doing both of them, at the same time, oh. yeah. it kind of goes to Mr. Ballard's question of, you know, uh, how are they going to pull this off? Sure. And so that we're hoping to work so with them at the same time. They're going to be working. Right. And that's why we want to look. We want to look at maybe a little bit different way so we can help everybody. Okay. Very good. Yeah, that would be I'm sorry. That would be my concern as well. If they're I mean, these are massive projects. So is this company prepared to do that kind of? Volume? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma all right, we have a motion and a second to approve the HVAC renovations at Hopgood. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposition? And there is none, all right? Contract for renovations at Reeves Rogers. We have a similar contract um, also for the HVAC renovations at Reeves Rogers. Bid responses were once again reviewed, not just by Murfreesboro City Schools, but also by the city department's purchasing department and Johnson and Bailey, who is the architect we're working with on this. Uh, X Energy was again the lowest bidder for this project. Um, in this project, there were actually five bids that were submitted. The funds for the project, as in the similar uh, one with Hobgood, are budgeted through ESSER 3.0, which has already been approved. And as I mentioned, this is the final year of funding we have for that to ha have access for that fund. The bid for the Reeves Rogers project was a little less at $1.293 million, and we are recommending board approval of the attached contract. I have a motion to approve the contract for Reeves Rogers. So moved. Thank you, Ms. Moore. We have a second. Second. Thank you, Ms. Long. Any question or comment? I see none. All in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Any opposition? And there is none. Thank you. Reports and information. Enrollment update. Welcome, sir. Good evening, board. It's a pleasure to talk to you for a first time in my new role. Good evening. Glad to have you here for the first it time is, in your new role. Time. It is day two of school. 
Yes. And we are still counting on our fingers and our pockets with the number of kids that we have. So we uh, have numbers for day two. Um, as we look at today, we have 8,944 8, students that are with us. We have um, 162 more students as of last school year compared to day two of today. When we take a look at um, our projections, we have 62 more students in Irma Siegel than we projected. We have 76 students at Black Fox that are more projected, coming in third place overall Creek with 46 more students, and in fourth we have Case Lane with 41. So those numbers, as we, we will be looking um, between now and Monday to make decisions about what we might need to do. As we look at projections that are below, Mitchell Nielsen is 27, one, 27 students below, Salem at 12, and Northfield at 10. So between now and next uh, Monday, we'll be meeting every day um, as an executive team, talking about where we're at with human resources and our attendance team and Dr. Duke to make decisions about where we believe kids are. Attendance clerks um, are also reporting numbers to us daily. And tomorrow we start to welcome our kindergartners. So that number will, will drastically help us as well. Can you give me those schools that are over, those first three or four that you gave us? Yes, sir. So, and so number one is Black Fox with 76 students. How many? 76. Okay. Number two is Irma Siegel plus 63. Okay. Overall Creek plus 46. Okay. And Case Lane plus 41. I do believe it's important to note that those are spread across kindergarten and sixth grade. So those aren't all in one grade level. And as we have conversations, we are projecting where we might make moves based on openings and overages and so forth. Thank you, sir. Can I clarify one, I'm sorry. Yes, sir. If I can clarify one thing, and I think it's really important that um, we look at these every day, as Mr. Rocha said. So the comparison you have is today, this year's day two to last year's day okay. two. So we try and track because we know during these first few weeks, and as, he said, as Mr. Rocha said, kindergartners join us tomorrow, so there'll be a whole new ball of fun we can't wait for, and the numbers will fluctuate even more. So it's very common for these numbers to fluctuate, but it does give us a really good indication of, as, as he pointed out, where we're already well ahead of where we were last year at this same time. But Ken, is these numbers, are these in school bodies or are these enrolled bodies? That is correct. That is students in seats or we know for a reason that they're out. So these numbers they like it at Black Fox, okay. So you had 76 more in school today than you had on the second day last year. That is correct. Okay, thank you. Ms. Long? Um, are there any schools you're, um, you're concerned about for overcrowding? We are looking at the, the PTR, so the, the pupil stu uh, student ratio, and we're looking at that threshold of 20%. Mm -hmm. So when we get above 20%, we wanna make sure we try to bring that down. So yes, there are some numbers a little higher, and there are some numbers that are a lo little lower. So as we look at the numbers the next couple of days, as kids come and go, we just look to see what changes we might need to make. Okay. Thank you, sir. A growing number, again. All right. 10 ready test scores. Thank you, Mr. Rocha. Yeah, I'm gonna ask Dr. George to join us at the podium. I've shared a little bit of this with the board um, through some emails and through some updates, but I wanted tonight just to give you an update of where we were specifically with what the state has released. And so I'm gonna ask Dr. George to go through that um, as soon as he gets this pulled up, and I'm gonna ask him to go to that first slide for me. Just as a reminder, when we think about, gotcha. yeah, there you go. When we think about our total accountability system, there are four pieces to that that play into our overall accountability. The only piece that we have so far is our achievement data, and that is it. And so that's what uh, Dr. George is going to look at with you tonight is to give you an overview of where we are with that piece. The rest of it has not officially been released publicly, um, and 
I'll be honest, we haven't received that yet as well. So it's a little later than we have normally received it, so we are anxiously awaiting that information. Uh, but with that, I'm going to let Dr. George talk a little bit about where we are with what the state has released publicly. Good evening, board. Good, Good evening. evening. Some more numbers. I know you all are excited. <laughs> um, so one of the things we would just wanted to go through, again, when we talk about everything that we do in Murfreesboro City, you know, we know that all of our students are known, safe, challenged, and really when we talk about this testing data that's been released, we really are focused focusing on that empowered strand. So everything that we're going to look at tonight is based on how we are performing in rel uh, relation to our five-year uh, strategic plan. Um, so with that said, we'll start with math first. Um, just as a reminder, our strategic plan was that in our baseline year, we were at 40% students meeting or exceeding expectations, and our goal by 2027 is to move to 75%. So with that said, um, as you can see, I have here our testing data for year 2021, 2022, and then this past year, 2023. And so the first call out is, is that we can say in grades three through six, we are now at 46.6% of our students meeting or exceeding grade level expectations on their math TCAP. A couple of things that I'm really excited about is that one, that's a three and a half percent increase from last year to this year. So that's a big number. But then one of the things I'm also very excited about and it's going to be a trend with all of our subjects is our two-year growth and so what we're looking at here is over a two-year period in grades three through six we've seen over a 6.6 .6 percent growth in the number of students that are proficient on their math assessment Dr. George, if I can just interrupt you for a second, and I think that two-year growth is really important and something that I've asked him to look at really carefully. I think sometimes we get into a habit, oh, Mr. Campbell and I had this conversation about reacting to data versus responding to data, and I think when we only look at data one year at a time, it's we make reactions and sometimes we do things and we don't think about really significant growth should be based on multiple years of work. And so really saying, okay, since we've been back from COVID, let's look at our two-year trends. What does that look like? And now how do we respond? And when we see, of course, if, if Ms. Arnett would hear, was here, she would tell you she loves a good stair step. Uh, and that's what you see there. <laughs> to show that what we're doing in this is showing not just one-year success, but continued success as we move forward. And to continue that, um, when we look at where we are in relation to the state, I'll make sure. Um, Currently, right now, we're projected to be about 8.5% above the state average. Um, and so that state average is 3 through 8. So that's where we're looking at just what we are in that 3.6, still 8.5% above that state average in mathematics. Um, something that I did also pull out for Dr. Duke, um, we know that the majority of students that take our TCAP test are in grades three, five, and so since sixth grade is so small, we just wanted to look at what the data said for where we are in three, five. And so with that, you can see that that number actually jumps up to 48%, so we are knocking on the door of 50%, and I did not touch anything. <laughs> can you all still see the on? No, yeah, it's black. Here we go. Oh, there we go. Um, so 48%, so knocking on the door of one out of every two students meeting or exceeding expectations. And so when we talk about that one year increase again, we look at now that's a 4.9% increase in our grades three through five. And then when we talk about again that two year increase, we actually jump up to a seven and a half percent increase over that two year period. Um, so as Dr. Duke said, when we look at that data, it's really about being able to make long term decisions. And what we can see is that we are continuing moving in the right direction with math okay. so it's not going to show you I don't think right now so um, I'm gonna go ahead and just move to the ELA and I'll make sure that y'all get this um, so in 2001 we set our baseline goal we were at 34 percent of our students meeting or exceeding expectations coming out of COVID and we set a very very ambitious goal like math for 66 percent of our kids to meet or exceed expectations by 2027 um, so what I want to show first is that when we look at grades three through six, this year we have 41.6% of our grade three through six students who are meeting or exceeding expectations. And one of the things that we looked at is year over year, we see a 1.4% increase in grades three, six, but we're really excited because when we look at grades three, six over that two year period, we're seeing 7.5% increase in proficiency of our students. What do I'm sorry, can I ask? Oh, yes. 
Go back to that previous slide. Got a seven and a half percent increase over two years, but only 1.4 over the last year. That's, that's a pretty good size drop from six six percent increase one year to 1.4 next year. And I will say this, and um, we saw pretty significant growth last year in ELA. We have made, and as the board that's been with me since I've been here, know that's been a, a very big focus of mine is to increase literacy rates. Um, we put some things in place and saw some pretty substantial growth in year one. Uh, Dr. George was uh, has been warning me all year that the likelihood of seeing that level of growth two years in a row um, may be a little harder to manage. But so even though we did see a smaller bump last year than we did the year before, again, looking at holistically, what we're seeing is we saw a significant increase and then we saw an, an even bigger increase. Sixth grade does play a little bit into that, I will tell you, because uh, in, in honesty, we don't know who we're gonna keep in sixth grade. Um, so it's a little harder to project out and look at that, and so uh, that's why Dr. George pulls out that three through five number. Um, I will say what I'm probably most excited about with ELA is if you go all the way back to 2017, which was when the change of the standards, our district had not been able to get past that 34, 35%, mm -hmm. and, and we knew we wanted to beat that and break that 40% threshold. So last year we kind of, we beat it. This year we not only beat it, we added to it again. Um, and so I think that is part of it, but looking at our continued trajectory, we see that especially in ELA, we're going in the right direction. Okay, thank you. And this goes to Dr. George, Dr. Duke, both. I guess the microphone would help. Dr. George or Dr. Duke, both. Would you say this is a culmination of the professional development, the curriculum, and just sort of the excellent teachers we're able to bring into MCS that has drawn this, this increase over time? Or is there something maybe missing from that equation? I think when we look at the data, it's a very coordinated effort all the way from what Dr. Pressel and Ms. Um, Darty have worked on with literacy. And I'll also say, and I will emphasize this as, as somebody who just looks at, looks at all the numbers, looks at everything, the materials that we use matter, the curriculum matters. And what we know is, is that when we get good curriculum in the hands of students, we see growth. And that's where I would even go back to when you look at that graph, we see we're not going up and down. We're seeing that trajectory climb. So um, like I told Dr. Duke, meeting that goal every year is it would be great, but hey, we're, we're still moving upwards. And this year, I think we're poised for another big year. If I, if I can also add, we don't have it in here because it hasn't been released publicly yet, but what, I will say what we are anticipating very much to see is very significant growth in our third and fourth grade, which really is showing, um, one, I think it tells a little bit of maybe the story of COVID of our students in fifth grade where we're not anticipating as much growth and what they went through, but it also speaks to what the focus Ms. Arnett with Ms. Darty has had on early literacy mm -hmm. and making sure every teacher in our district has been gone through that, has gone through the early literacy training, our intentional focus the board has had of separating even the instructional support. So we have a person that's just focused on K2 and just focused on 3-6. Um, I'm very excited to share grade level data if it looks like what we anticipate it's going to look like because I think it's going to show very clearly that what we've been doing the last two years in early literacy is catching up with a cohort of students. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Duke. Ms. Long? That sort of answers my question a little. The summer school numbers do not play into this. Is that correct? Correct. This is just what we did in April and early May for TCAP. Okay. At what point do the summer school numbers feed into this? They don't. Summer they school don't. has no, the, the post test for summer school has no weight on accountability at all. The okay. only reason they do the post test mm -hmm. is to meet the requirement of the law to see if that individual student has made adequate progress to, to see if they can progress on to fourth grade without further interventions. Mm -hmm. So at no point does that post test get factored into accountability. It's still like it always has been one shot in April and that's what we're reporting on. Yeah. Very well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, so when we look at where we sit, just like we saw with math in relation to the state average, we're still sitting a good 5% above where the state average is. So last year, 5.1, this year, exactly 5%. Um, so again, I think when we look at the growth and we see where we're still maintaining in relation, I think that we're right on where we want to be. 
And then another one, just like I showed with math, when we um, filter out and look just at 3-5, we can see that 43% of our students in grades 3 through 5 met or exceeded expectations on TCAP. And so when we look at that one-year growth, that actually bumps us up to a 2.7% increase from year to year. And then again, a big number that I'm, I'm very excited to report is that over a two-year period, we're looking at 8.5%. And so when we actually sat down and the slide had messed up, you didn't get to see math, but when we talk about what eight and a half percent really looks like, we can say today that over a two year period, we have approximately 340 more students who are proficient in third through fifth grade ELA. Um, so I think a lot of times we, we get lost in percentages and what that means. And so for math, it was about 310. Um, but I think that when we talk about that those are real students sitting in seats in our classrooms and they're moving to the next grade level or to the next grade band, I think that's a big celebration that we can take over a two-year period. Absolutely. And to say eight and a half percent, and the message I've, I said to every teacher when we spoke at schools last week, Ms. Arnett and I, is, is when we look at three through five, and again, that's, I think we have to look at that specifically because sixth grade is a little bit of a question mark for us, right? And so it can, it can depending on who stays, it can help us or it can maybe hurt us, and it's not a great way to track it. When we look at three through five, that's very reliable to say we're knocking on the door of a 10% increase over two years uh, really speaks to what uh, Mr. Richardson early, which I think is great training by our instructional team. And again, I will hold our instructional team up against anyone in this state of Tennessee excellent materials and helping our teachers better understand how to use those materials um, and then excellent professional development. Um, just um, earlier this summer, we had about 30 teachers, third through sixth grade teachers th through five days of intensive literacy training with Dr. Presnell. And um, the feedback we received from that was just the value of, of getting to understand how to use those materials and immediately apply it to the classroom. So as uh, Dr. George says, we are, I feel very optimistic about where we are. I'm very proud of where we are. Um, and I think we're well poised to, to have another successful year. Okay, and the final thing that we'll look at is we'll look at science. So when we set that baseline year, we had 39.4% of our students meeting or exceeding their science TCAP or meeting or exceeding expectations on their science TCAP. And we set a goal for 2027 to be at 65%. Um, so when we look at where we've gone from 2021 at that 39.4, I'll just call out that we are now knocking on the door 45%. So um, depending on how rounding takes place, and again, that's grades three, six. So what we can say is that from last year, similar to math, we had about a three and a half percent increase. And then over that two year period, we're up over 5.1% in grades three through six. Do we need to consider the effect that COVID has had on last year? I will say, would you say I will say that the department has not taken down any language that recognizes that COVID may or may not have played an impact on any data that's released. Um, so I will say I can say that from uh, and I would say best. anecdotally, like I said, we're we're seeing some pretty significant dis I don't say discrepancies, but I think as we look preliminarily at pre things just internally that Dr. George has done on his Excel spreadsheet, which he does very well, uh, <laughs> uh, unofficially, you know, as we begin to look at grade levels, again, I think we are able to see students who miss significant portions of their schooling at COVID and those in the younger grades who now were less impacted by that. So I think anecdotally, we're kind of seeing that. Um, but again, I feel like we're in a great place. And I think as more data gets released, we're hopeful that it continues to be what we feel like is positive news and really a, a, a tribute to what our teachers are doing every day. Um, and so with that, that is the achievement side. You know, we're still waiting on the official numbers for what that's going to determine. But the next set of data that's going to roll out for us is we're going to get school level TCAP data that will be released. And as Dr. Duke said, uh, we are not certain what that timeline will be. We have our internal projections, but we don't want to put anything out there that um, hasn't been released by TDOE. Um, yes, ma'am. I was just going to say, uh, do you do you have any idea what's taken them so long to get the growth scores in? Because usually we get them in July. I think that there's been a lot of change at TDOE since July 1. Um, that could play into it. And then I do know that there also has been some accountability protocol, which is what we're measured on. There have been some um, mandates from the U.S. Department of Education that they have asked for TDOE to, to make 
changes to that accountability protocol. So I think that we're just still in this really kind of limbo state right now. Um, but I, I'm hoping, I'm hoping we get that data a lot sooner than we do later. Okay. And also I wanted to, on the science, if I've done my math correct, um, 2027, we should be, if we stay on the same constant growth each year, in 2027, we'll be at 70%. And so our goal is 65. So we're definitely going to, we're killing it on science. And that's one of the things in our dashboard for our five year plan. We update that and we know where we are in relation to those goals. And so we, we plan accordingly around that. And then the, now the math and the ELA is a little bit lower, but you know, that's only if we just have one, the steady rate going. I'm sure we're going to do better. And I will say with ELA specifically, that's something that's really interesting if you look at data, and, and, and I'll be the first to say it is an, an incredibly ambitious goal that we've set, but that's what goals need to be. I was thinking that. It, it yeah. is. It needs to be ambitious. But even if you look at um, some of the top performing states in the country, which is usually Massachusetts is what's pointed to as the highest achieving state in the district, they have a very difficult time getting much further than 50% on those ELA assessments for NAEP. And um, so uh, it is an incredibly ambitious goal, but uh, we want to have a clear target of what we're shooting for. And um, as Dr. George says, we monitor that every year. Um, at, in our January workshop, of course, um, we'll share that updated dashboard with you as we think about do we need to adjust our five-year plan. Um, but Again, our focus is not just one year, how are we doing over the last two years, and then next year the third, to are we seeing not, not, a, not a spike, that's not what we want, we want to see continued elevated growth for our students. Thank you. You're welcome. And so with that, again, we talk about school level TCAP will be released. We will get TVOS data, which will be our growth for both the district and schools. And then we'll also have chronic absenteeism data that will roll out our WIDA performance or our ELPA performance, um, and then finally we'll get our district and school designation. So that's kind of the timeline of everything that we're waiting on. So when one domino falls, hopefully the next one falls subsequently right after, and then we'll know where we're sitting and plan accordingly. And so that's it for my presentation. Are there any other questions? I do have a, a quick question. I know that first grade and second grade do not play into the state data, but I think we all realize how important it is for us to uh, to target uh, issues that we can see. Do we analyze that data as well? Yes, ma'am. So we do have a goal in the uh, in the five year plan to reduce the percentage of students below the 25th percentile. And so while I didn't report that tonight, I can say that from last year to this year in spring to spring, we had a three and a half percent reduction in that number so i think you know when we talk about again where we're moving towards on that trajectory for that five-year plan i think we're well in line with with the reduction in that number that we wanted to see and to clarify because it's a little different in k12 yes. because what we're doing instead of looking at hitting a proficiency rate we're actually looking at reducing the percentage of students in the lowest performance category right. because below the 25th percentile is the measure for that the, that student is in need of reading intervention, uh, in need of additional support. So our goal is, and specifically in our plan, we target the end of first grade, which is really a, a culmination of what's going on in our kindergarten classrooms and what's going on in our first grade classrooms. So as he said, from spring of 2022 to 2023, in first grade specifically, the, the number of students in that lower than 25 percentile group uh, decreased by almost 4%. Well, my first and second grade heart wants to make sure that we are catching those those guys early and i am a firm believer and again we look at grade level data the only way to make long-term substantial change to reading scores is to address it in k12 and miss darty is laser like focused on that uh, and is working hard with our schools to make sure we have ongoing training for those um, early literacy uh, students and accountability measures that we put in place for ourselves. Because as you said, there's not really a state accountability measure. And so sometimes it's easy if we're not careful to lose focus of what's happening in those early grades. But it is the only way we will raise reading scores long term. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Wonderful report. Thank you very much. Thank you.
All right, director's update, Dr. Duke. Uh, you being that? the director, we'll listen to you. Yes. <laughs> uh, just a few updates uh, that's kind of been covered. Uh, as Mr. Rogers said, kindergarten phase in does begin tomorrow, so we are thrilled to welcome our some of our youngest students into the building. It's always a fun morning when we welcome kindergartners into school for the first time. Uh, next Monday, and they will be phasing in all week, so really it's next Monday, August 14th, is going to be the first day when every student K-6 is present. Uh, also, Mr. Roach talked about we are actually meeting every afternoon. We have a standing meeting this week to, as you said, evaluate those numbers. If we need to make staffing changes, that's never ideal, but we always have to know we're not always, our projections are good but they're not perfect. And so if we have to make changes, we'll do that as quickly as possible uh, to make sure we can uh, get the needs met. And then a final reminder is that our next board meeting is Tuesday, August 22nd, two weeks from tonight. This is our annual fall workshop that we have at the central office. And as a reminder, it will be an extended meeting that will start at five o'clock instead of six o'clock um, at central office. And I know Ms. Van Cleve will remind us all of that. So with that, those are all my updates. All right, thank you. All right, Mr. Ballard, I thank turn you, the Mr. desk to you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I would just go back and visit uh, the communications and Ms. Trail, her comment about the City School Foundation. Mm. And we're hosting a tennis tournament on the 27th and 28th of October. And as you, many of you in the room know, but those in the audience uh, in TV land may not know how much, how important this City School Foundation is to the, the teachers themselves because the money that is raised during these uh, event fundraising events goes directly to the teachers in their grants that they qualify for. So I say all that to say that get ready, get psyched up and get out there and talk about the tennis tournament. It's gonna be the 27th, 28th, it's a doubles tournament. And so I would encourage you to sharp it up and get out. It'll be a great fall tournament. And this is the first annual, and I'm sure there's gonna be a second and third annual, but this will be a big fundraiser for the, for the uh, school foundation. And we, we all, this, this supersedes the race, the, the uh, 5K and 10K. And you wanna remind us now where this tournament's gonna be It's gonna be, gonna be at Adams Place, not Adams Place, excuse me. <laughs> Well, we might have one. I'm not there yet. I'll be in the morning at Adams Place. <laughs> it's, it's at the Adams Tennis uh, Tennis. And that's at Old Fort Park. Old Fort Park, that's right. So get you a partner and get out there and play some tennis. No judgments. <laughs> Thank you. Anything Sign else in your meeting Sign today? Me up. I'm there. Anything else from your meeting today? Didn't you have the foundation meet today? Yeah, we did have a foundation Anything meeting. Anything else yeah. coming out that we need to know of? Well, early? the teachers, uh, and I think uh, Lisa talked about this, but the teacher grants are getting ready to be prepared to, and I think it's open now, is that right, Lisa? It is. Yeah, so mm -hmm. teachers can be aware and get their pencils sharpened to get grant money, file a grant, to, or application for a grant to get some money for their own personal projects they want to fulfill. So that's the biggest thing going on is getting that ready and, and getting those applications in so they can start to be judged. Okay. All right, anything else coming for the board? If not, thank you for a wonderful meeting and we have a motion to adjourn. Some of us, Chairman. There's a second. All in favor, good night. Good night. Good night. <laughs>